This conference will this conference will now be recorded. <sighs> Technology. All right. So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is the RTD Accountability Committee Operations Subcommittee. We'll call this to order. Um, let's do introductions. Will um, uh, everyone, let's see, why don't we, uh, I'll just go by uh, people's uh, names and, and then you can, um, I'll just go down the list and everyone can uh, uh, introduce themselves quickly. Um, so let's go to the list that comes up. Let's do it this way. Um, Ro well, Crystal, you want to start? Sure. Uh, Crystal Murillo, Aurora City Council member um, and a member of the committee. Kristen? Kristen Trustman, accessoride passenger and member of the committee. Doug? Assume you mean Doug Rex? I see Doug Monroe there too. Oh, Doug Rex. Sorry, Doug it. Monroe. Oh, well, oh. I'm going to go seeing him talking now. Doug Rex, Executive <laughs> Director, Dr. Cox. Doug Monroe with RTD Planning. Joyce now? Hi, I'm Jyotsna Vishwakarma. I'm the RTD Chief Engineer, providing support to RTD to get the Accountability Committee whatever support they need from us, our materials. Thank you. Oh, yes. Thank you, Jyotsna. Luke? Hi, I'm Luke Palmasano. I'm with the City of Aurora. Dea. Hi everyone, Dea Zva with Mile High Connects and a member of this committee. Nicole. All right, uh, let's see who's after. Uh, Alex. Alex Hadright, Boulder County Transportation Planner. Chris. Uh, Chris Frampton at East West Partners and a member of the Accountability Advisory Board. George. George Crystal, Boulder County Interested Citizen. Jeff. Well, Jeff Becker's here and he will be talking to us uh, very soon. Uh, Jesse. Jesse Carter, Manager of Service Planning and Scheduling. And I'm sorry. Jordan. Um, this is Jeff Becker. Sorry, Sorry I, I was I was muted. Um, it's Jeff Becker, a senior manager of service development for <clears throat> excuse me, RTD. And then Jordan Sanchez, um, contract lobbyist for RTD. And let's see, Julie. Uh, Julie Duran Molica, um, Northland City Council. Kathleen. Kathleen Brackey, Boulder County. And Miller. All right. Um, so let's uh, let's continue. Um, 
the first action item is uh, refining the subcommittee objectives uh, if uh, additional require, uh, refinement is necessary. And I can go to the document and uh, this is saved from last time uh, after we went through all three subcommittees. Uh, so uh, if anyone has any comments or questions, uh, happy to take that now and have any discussion as necessary. This is Daya. I am curious. I did not see these on the website. So where might folks be able to find these? We we uh, we we can post them on the website. I just wanted to uh, let each of the subcommittees have one more chance at it, and then um, we'll we'll post it on the on the web page that we have dedicated to the committee. Um, are we able to revisit these? I mean, I'm sure things will come up in the future because I, I don't have any specific edits at the at the moment. Um, but I guess I'm wondering if we're nimble enough to be able to um, amend as we see fit. Sure. Yeah. Of course. Uh, as we as we dive in, there 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 could be some um, changes that make sense that 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 we haven't thought of yet. So I I think that's I think that's fine. Okay. Counselor, this is Ron Pepster. We we definitely intended that these would be kind of the starting point, not restrictive, but sort of an initial guidance to each of the subcommittees about the major components of the RTD accountability committee assignment for each of the subcommittees to delve into. But they they're not meant to be restrictive. I think the work will lead us, uh, lead you to where you need to go. But we just wanted to document sort of the at least the initial starting point of the key issues that each of the subcommittees would begin working on. Perfect, thank you. All right, any any other thoughts, questions, conversation? Okay, well then we will uh, move on uh, to the next action item, um, overview of um, RTD service planning by uh, Jeff Becker of RTD staff. Um, just give me one second and I will add him as a presenter. It allows me. So where do I do here? Here we go. Can, can you hear me? Uh, thank you. I can hear you. I'm going to make yeah. you a presenter so that you can share your screen. Okay. So now I don't see you in the, there we go. Everything seems to be on a delay. Okay, Jeff, I've made you a presenter. While we're waiting on Jeff, just like to um, thank him for coming and, and providing this overview to, to help with our discussion today. So I'm not sure what to do. Do I? Just click on screen share, share screen. Uh, yes, you can you can click on screen share on the bottom. If it doesn't work for you, I can um, I can pull up your um, your presentation and and uh, and go through it for you if it doesn't work. Well, it just brings down something about go to meeting needs to use accessibility features, and I don't know how to do all that. So I want to just bring it up. Uh, sure. Just give me one second. Let's see here. Uh, that didn't work. All right.
the, I think we called Jeffrey Carter, got introduced or not, but he's also um, on the service development and he'll be able to help answer questions if you have any on uh, what we do. Okay. Um, so this is the service development division of RTG, and we're actually composed of a couple of subgroups, our planning and scheduling group and our support group. So next slide. <clears throat> so how do we approach transit service development? Well, we are um, implementing that part of RTD's mission which is cost-effective service throughout the district. Um, we develop a variety of services suited to a variety of markets, the family of services, if you will. Uh, we determine which service and what level of service is appropriate to fill the need, connect all the services together in a network to accommodate today's dispersed travel patterns, and all services are designed to match the level of service with demand to ensure good performance and sustainability. Next slide. So we have uh, four major functions, um, exploration and development of new and innovative services, and evaluation of all requests for service changes, integration of service planning with marketing, capital planning, operations, and all the rest of our organization overall. Evaluation of service performance according to RTD service policies and standards with recommendations for proposed changes and an annual report to the board. Development and implementation of three system-wide service changes each year maintenance and development of tools for planning and analysis, including scheduling, run cutting, geographic information systems, ridership monitoring and analysis, and performance evaluation, among others. Next slide. <clears throat> Gathering information for input into service development process is a continuous process throughout the year. It's essentially ongoing, never ending. Um, service planning decisions are data driven, both quantitative and qualitative data are used. And what you see here on this slide are some of the types and sources of information that we gather. Next slide. Oops, she went down too much. That's sorry. Yeah, no, you're right. Sort of probably the same, sorry. Um, so after information is gathered, it's compiled for assessment under the guiding principles of, as I mentioned, RTVs service policies and standards. <clears throat> this document is key for us and provides a comprehensive rationale for service planning decision making. Some of the policies and standards are listed here. They provide both warrants and constraints, as well as absolute and relative measures for anyone to review RTD's analysis of any service service proposal we make and any recommendation. Next slide. This graphic is um, hard to, to see, um, but what it represents is the timeline for making three service changes over 52 weeks each year. There's an even more detailed chart for those involved to follow in order to ensure the changes are implemented on time. The text on the left outlines some of the major tasks for our service planners. To make 
the uh, to take the actions needed to affect the um, uh, implementation of the changes in the chart on the right. Next slide. And the last one. Uh, <clears throat> regarding service performance evaluation. Every route in every service type is evaluated for two key economic indicators as the initial and primary assessment of how they contribute value to RTD. Effectiveness measures attainment of the objective, maximize ridership within the budget, and is presented on the y-axis on this chart as subsidy for boarding. Efficiency or productivity is presented on the x-axis as boardings per vehicle hour. The charts offer a convenient comparative analysis of all classes of services, illustrating both absolute and relative performance. This chart that we have here on the right shows each of our types of service. So at the top on the y-axis, says zero dollars or zero subsidy for passenger, which is better than going down the y-axis, which is increasing subsidy for passenger. And on the x-axis, you have boardings per hour. And so the more boardings per hour, the better. And so over to the right is better productivity. So if you look at this chart, you'll see the mall is having the highest uh, productivity and the lowest subsidy for boarding at the top. And that would be the best performing service we have. Even though there's no fair revenue, so there's no, there's no um, revenue coming into it, there's so many riders that it becomes the most productive and cost-effective service that we operate. Uh, all this is, is for last year now, and not COVID. At the bottom left, it diamet diametrically opposed is accessorized, which is for people with disabilities and it's required by federal regulation. Um, it's demand responsive service. Um, it picks people up at their door and takes them to where they want to go. Um, that is our most expensive type of service that we operate in low productivity. And then you have all the others in between. And you'll see basically the group together with um, the, CBD meaning central businesses or downtown oriented bus routes, regional routes, and the rest. And of course, rail. So this is our first shot taking a look at how we are performing. And then we go into greater detail. So this is kind of an overview of what we do. I'm not sure what you all are interested in if you have some questions. But uh, if you do, we'll be glad to address them. Thank, thank you all. Thank you, Jeff. Um, are there any questions from the group? Matthew, this is Doug. Uh, I did have a question for Jeff. I was actually intrigued by the, the van pool and, and where that is on the graph. Jeff, can you explain why the subsidy for that is so low? Is that simply because we get that from an outside, is an outside subsidy or, or I'm, just, I'm just trying to understand that? Sure. Um, so you'll see we do have quite a variety of services and band pool being one of them. Um, it's not very productive, right? Because it only can carry about uh, maybe um, 10 or 15, maybe 15 people. Right. Uh, but it has very low subsidy because, well, there's no paid driver, and that is 70% of the cost of transit. Um, and not only that, but the people that are in the van pool share the cost of the, of the service. In other oh, words, like fuel in that, it. Jeff? Yes, fuel and everything is included in the calculation of what the charge, how much each van pool costs. And it can vary depending on the number of people that are actually in the van pool. But RTD's share 
um, is is kind of we we fixed our share of the subsidy. But what you see here is the total subsidy for for the van pool program. It's not just somebody's share. Same for all of these um, types of services. Jeff, I, it's just Doug again. I just have a follow-up question. Um, so, so these numbers for 2019 are those pretty, pretty similar and consistent with past years? Yes, it it doesn't change too much. Um, of course, our costs have increased over the, over the many years, um, but the relation that doesn't necessarily change the relationship. Of what you see on this chart, which does give you a, a, a really good snapshot of all the different types of services and uh, and how productive and cost effective each one is, one is relative to the other. Very good. Thank you, sir. Uh, this is Councilmember Murillo. Um, my question is, is this uh, a, a best practice on how to measure service performance um, in the evaluation? Are there other I guess transit districts that measure performance evaluation differently. I'm just trying to get a sense of uh, what the landscape looks like. Yes, there's um, actually subsidy per rider or boarding passenger and ridership per per vehicle service hour are the two standard high level. This is a high level evaluation of services. Um, and we can actually look at that for each route, and we do. There are other measures. You know, there is, for example, some agencies use a, a fare recovery ratio, which is how much, um, uh, what percentage of the cost is covered by the actual fare revenue. Um, of course, there are many other points of evaluation, like schedule again. How well are we performing? You know, in, in that way. So there are actually a, a, a lot of different ways of looking at the service and we measure each one of them. Um, but this is the overall, what's the health of a particular type of service in a particular route in general? Does that make sense? Um, yeah, so, to clarify, this is um, the measurement we use in order to determine what type of services um, and where is it, Did I capture that accurately? Yes, yes. Um, each of these services performs um, differently according to the particular market. Um, of course, the, you'll see the local routes there, and that's good for you know the relatively modern, modern and higher density areas that we have in the metro area, uh, the flex ride, for example, is used out in the rather low density suburban areas. Um, this really actually reflects how well they perform, and then when we see how well they perform. We then know other places that are similar, and that's where we would provide that type of a service. So this also helps us not only uh, evaluate the service, but yes, help decide what service is appropriate to what market we're trying to serve. Okay. Um, do we know how we compare if these are standard um, benchmarks or ways of measuring success? Do we know how we compare to other um, cities similar to ours? And if if so, um, what the difference, I guess, how would we evaluate, account for the difference between performance between like size cities? Yeah, that's, that's a real rough question. Um, that's called, you know, a, a peer review analysis. And that's done periodically by some uh, organizations or some transit agencies. Um, you have to try to well, what are my peer agencies? And we do have kind of stuff that we usually um, compare ourselves to. It's rather difficult to take even these two um, and, and take what it is in total and then compare it to, say, Seattle, Portland, San Diego, and other places that are, you know, very, they're, 
Oregon or Phoenix, where uh, or or Salt Lake City, Utah, where we are compared because of uh, the metropolitan area size. But then you get down to the next step. It's you know every metropolitan area looks different. Um, the objectives of their board are different. Some cases we want to have a lot of coverage. Some cases we want to keep the price low or whatever it might be. So uh, we do have there are com compilations. It's kind of like you know you know the best which just came out I saw in the paper recently the best places to live you know and they compare different characteristics. Um, I kind of take those with a grain of salt because it's a difficult to to move the context for the comparison. But yes, such numbers can be made available. Would you mind explaining a little more about how you make uh, route decisions with this data? Didn't quite, you mentioned that and I didn't quite follow it. Sure. So the first thing we do is we take a look at this chart. But then for each of those services, like it says CBD, there's the downtown bus route. There's like, um, I forget, perhaps um, 20 or 25 of those routes. And we take all of those routes and essentially expand it into its own chart. And we look and we can see how each route compares to each other in, in this term. And that's our starting point. And you can see where there'd be really good routes like our Colfax Avenue route. And we don't usually do too much with that, but we know that except that we might need to add service to it. And then we see, so we, we have like a a standard, a minimum, and a maximum, and we can draw a box around the services. And we can see, well, which ones, and we look at 10% of the worst performing routes that fall out of this box, and then we are now drawn to those, take a look at those, well, what can we do with those to make them better? So in some cases, we need to do more marketing. In some cases, we need to um, reduce services or combine them with something else. In some cases, we need to look more detailed at the route itself. We can look at the, say, the boardings per hour along each section of a route or by time period and say, well, we need to cut service during the midday. So this is, gives us the starting point because you can't look at everything all the time. And this is a very logical way to say, well, where do we start? We well, look at the best and the, and the worst and we delve into those in more detail. That's, that is really interesting and pretty cool. Are there other metrics that you look at besides subsidy and ridership? Um, those are the main ones. Um, I mentioned another one, for example, um, schedule appearance. That is how well are the, are the buses running? You know, are they running according to the way we say they are? That's one of the major things that people look at. But there are other measures, of, you know, other things we look at. We look at density as the main thing for transit on the, in residential density to see, well, where should we have uh, these types of services in the first place? You know, if, if that's a, a starting point in the planning process. Um, uh, we look at the, you know, the how many bus stops we have, you know, um, uh, uh, where is a, a low income, you know, perhaps low income people. Um, there's all kinds of details that we look at. There is a, um, our, our transit um, policies and standards, which I think we sent you, uh, and you can take a look at that, at, and there's, about 20 pages of, of different things that we look at, you know, what's the appropriate frequency of service and all like that. If you're looking right. at a map, it actually is a pretty good way. The underlying uh, dark, the light green, the no green is really the basis, which is density. And if you looked at that map, um, you would see how our individual routes cover the density of our of our uh, metropolitan area and that what type of service works best in each type of density. All right, and one thing I do wanna mention, I'm sorry, this is Jesse Carter, uh, Service Planning and Scheduling. Uh, we do look at 
we, we gather information via our APC uh, or automatic passenger counter, and it gives us the ability to look at our ridership trends on individual bus routes by trip. So we're looking for things like max load, as well as how many passengers per hour to determine whether or not we need to add trips or whether or not something's performing in a certain time uh, segment as well. So we do that for both bus and rail. So I'm hoping that helps. Fascinating. Can I ask a follow-up question on that one? Sure. Um, was is that also um, a best practice um, or a similar way that um, the trips are measured um, in other uh, metropolitan uh, districts? Yes, uh, it's becoming the uh, uh, for I'd say medium to large agencies that APCs are kind of the the way to go. Um, the other way that ridership is measured, and the way when I first started way back in the 90s, uh, we were using individual ride checkers, and that denied us the ability to look at the system as a whole at once. Uh, it gave us scant information as well in, in terms of we could only survey a certain number of routes per year. So now the information that we, we, we get from the automatic passenger counters and collected through the ride check plus gives us a, a a great deal of data on both on-time performance and on ridership. So if you were to ask our peer group, as Jeff had mentioned, uh, DART, uh, TriMet, uh, Seattle, uh, they all are using a data. Okay, um, maybe, you know, I don't wanna bog up the questions with asking about how things are measured or best practices, but that's, I guess, the, where my head is at in a lot of these. For example, I'd be curious to know how you measure density um, and employment um, because I, it would be interesting to know how and if that aligns with how um, our city planners for like a municipality um, also measure um, those two metrics um, to see if they align from like a city planning perspective. Yeah, that's the beauty of that. Yes, we, we, yeah, we use the same data. Uh, we use the doctor card. Uh, data and census data and um, other tracking data, we all use the same data. And we, what you see displayed is exactly the same. Okay. Yeah, if I, right. I, I had another question. Um, so I was actually a little surprised to see, see the rail, you know, the effectiveness to be next to the best versus um you know 16th street mall um uh, service for for obvious reasons so jeff if you were to aggregate the rubber tire uh services that are provided by rtd um i would assume just because of the the ridership of of course would be higher in aggregate in total does that then rival where the the rail effectiveness is on that chart just curious <laughs> Yeah, so, well, let me tell you one thing about this chart is it includes all costs. It includes the capital cost as well, okay? And normally when you see this chart at another agency or or even when we use it occasionally on for different things, it's really just the annual budget or operating cost that's included. But that does not give you the true picture and uh, of and and that and it gets to to the heart of your question uh, the rail has a very high capital cost, and in order to make to make true what I said, which this is really allows you to keep, to compare every type of service with the other, you really need to have the the, the total cost so that's why. The rail, you know, it, 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 it has pretty high productivity, but it has, you know, a bit higher cost per passenger because of its high capital cost. And especially for RTD, which we're relatively new at this, and we've been adding new stuff pretty recently, even over the last 10 years, it takes a while to get to where you are making good use of all that capital. Um, investment. I hope that makes sense to you. It does. Thank you, sir.
Matt, did you want to explain what the the attachment was in in the in the agenda that we sent out and, and some of the graphics like you're showing right now? Sure. Yeah. So this is um, this is a useful uh, tool that that RTD has been putting out for well over a decade, and I believe I, I believe Jeff that you're um, one of the primary um, authors of this, and I, I've I, it's been very useful for me um, in, in my work uh, for a long time. So it it goes through all of the um, Productivity and um, you know it 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 um, it, it provides a, a good uh, comparison amongst the various services that RTD provides, but within their service categories. Um, and so it 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 makes all of all of those comparisons uh, by service class, and then. Um, one thing that's very useful as well, and it's scrolling down very slowly, of course, um, in addition to the charts that show where each route ranks uh, amongst its service class, like for instance, here are these CBD local routes, um, it also shows the ridership and the subsidy for per boarding and other critical statistics for every single service that RTD provides. And so this chart, this table right here um, shows the, um, the uh, CBD local routes. And you can see the, the, uh, that many of them are, are pretty consistent with say a, um, uh, a, a a characteristic like boardings per, uh, per hour. Many of them are roughly in the same range, but then there are some outliers. And then you can also see uh, which of, of the services uh, have the most boardings. And um, you could see that, for example, uh, the 15 and 15L, which are both on East Colfax, uh, uh, perform the, the the highest amongst boardings in this class, for example. Um, then you can also, you know, see the the, the fair revenue generated not only by uh, and, and as well as all the other categories, not only by each route but also by the the service class uh, as a whole. And so this is one useful tool to evaluate. Uh, the the services amongst each other within their service classes because as Jeff explained um, you know the, the many of the service classes uh, are different types of services and they shouldn't be compared uh, a, a service in one of the classes shouldn't be compared uh, uh, with a service in a different class it's better to compare them uh, amongst their um, their peers in their own service class. So that was the CBD local. Uh, here are the urban local routes. And then if you go down further, you could see the um, the suburban local routes. And then if you can go down, if you go down further, you can see the regional routes. Then there's some special services. The flex ride, I believe everyone uh, um, knows uh, what the, the flex ride are. They uh, were recently called call and ride. They're pretty similar to, to what the call and ride service was. They're, they're demand response. They're accessible, uh, but they're, um, they're, um, within certain geographic boundaries and they're they're not a fixed route so uh, you essentially it's like a dial and ride you you call up or you make an appointment uh, online uh, for a trip between two points in one specific ge uh, geographic area then it also if you go down you can see the different rail service both commuter rail and light rail then, um, as uh, Jeff was talking about, uh, you have the um, 
accessoride service, which is the complementary paratransit, which is required by the Americans with Disabilities Act. And then you can see the van pool and um, another uh, shopper special service. Um, so that RTD releases this document uh, annually, and it's very helpful to, to see how their various services are performing. And RTD staff uh, do use this document amongst others uh, to formulate recommendations uh, for any changes to services, whether those be um, cuts or increases to services. Um, Jeff, uh, since we, we have you and your colleagues on the line, uh, would you be able to give uh, a, a brief synopsis about how um, uh, the, the, the process uh, is uh, when it, with regard to service changes that, are, that happen uh, multiple times a year? Uh, I, um, focusing on um, the interactions uh, with, uh, with the public, uh, the, the, the meetings uh, with um, local agency staff, and the, the, the public meetings? Sure, Jess, Jesse, I think you can go through that real quick. Thank you, Jesse. Okay, sure. Um, we have typically three service changes per year. Uh, they are in January, May, August, slash September. Uh, those timeframes are typically set up so it allows us to turn up and turn down our service for the school year since uh, students, both post-secondary and uh, High school students are a large portion of our, our ridership. Um, it also gives us a chance to allow our operators to vote their runs. We do have the collective bargaining agreement. So those are the dates that the CBA, that are listed in the CBA that we vote. Um, anytime we make a service change that uh, changes a route greater than 25%, uh, we are required to have a public hearing to talk about that route. Uh, but more typically, we are a little more stringent than, than that FTA requirement. It's whenever we change something substantially, uh, we do uh, hold public hearings and put out public information regarding that change. And those opportunities are usually taken uh, with the run boards um, that I just mentioned, the January, May, August, last September timeframe. Uh, so the public hearings are, are held, um, but at the same time, we go to the board of directors prior to uh, going out to the public just to kind of give everyone an idea of what we're thinking about. Uh, Jeff Becker puts out a report to a list of municipalities and other uh, stakeholder type groups uh, and the the process begins. Uh, to give you an example right now just last just actually this Tuesday we went to the board of directors about January. So uh, with that Jeff released information about the January proposals we are going to have our public hearings starting October 7th, running through October 12th. We're gonna do them virtually because unfortunately we're still in COVID. So um, once that process is finished, we will then report back to the operations subcommittee of the board uh, for their review. And then in the third week of, or fourth week this time in October, they will vote on the January service changes. That process is repeated for each one of the, the run board. So, are, are there any questions? I'm not sure if that answers uh, sure. the question. Matt. Yeah, J Jesse, the, Ron Papsdorf with, uh, I'm the transportation director at Dr. Todd. Thank you and, and thanks to Jeff for the background um, explanation. I guess what might be helpful to this subcommittee would be, I mean, this is, this is very much a data-driven process. My understanding is this sort of, this helps RTD staff identify maybe those set of um, services that uh, should be reviewed and analyzed. Yep. I guess at, at what point do other consider are other considerations taken into, into account by staff before you kind of turn that analysis into a new service change proposal? You know, I wish the job was as simple as just looking at graphs and getting the data in. We get constant um, input and requests for changes to service coming from everywhere. As far as who our customers are, we have internal customers such as our operators who are asking us to look at the performance of a route based on either overloads, you know, not having enough uh, capacity on the system or based on a non-compliance with, uh, with um, on-time performance. 
So we also get requests from outside entities, like I'm responding to a request from a um, distribution center that's located just on the edge of the district, asking when can they expect to have service out to that area. So of course we would have to evaluate that uh, a deviation on a given route for that that particular new location. So uh, the information that we take in is it's a, it's a daily basis, and we get constant and tons of information coming in from our customer service via telephone, via email, um, and a lot of different ways like that. But also, I do want to make sure that the information that Jeff had provided in the presentation is kind of a starting point in the annual evaluation. However, uh, if you were to look at, if you remember the graph that showed some of the uh, the routes that are outside the box, outside of the everything's good box, that's just a starting point. We then take, if we were to identify a route like we did with the Route 32 in the 2019 data, um, we had to look at the route on a segment by segment and trip by trip basis. And in that, we found that, yes, the eastern portion of the Route 32 was not performing. So the proposal was made for the May service change that the uh, service be reduced on the Route 32, both on the weekday and, and, and weekend. But through the whole public process and through the decision by the board of directors, we ended up only implementing the weekend uh, cutbacks on the uh, on the Route 32 on the east side. So. It's an ongoing fluid process with lots of moving parts. That's the way I would describe it at this point. Yeah, I, I think that's that's helpful and I, I appreciate that additional explanation, Jesse. I guess what I'm getting at is beyond sort of the technical performance measures, um, you know, when are, where are and what other considerations are taken into account as RTD staff is formulating a proposal or are they not? And I'm thinking of equity issues, geographic coverage issues, um, serving low-income population issues, so, like those are those are kind of the the other sort of issues that I'm I'm wondering when are those brought into the process and are they not considered by RTD staff at all? Are those do you just rely on sort of the public feedback and the board feedback? I just want to understand that dynamic a little bit better. Oh sure, sure, and that's actually an excellent question. Uh, when we consider the, the the route and who it serves, uh, that the items that you bring up are always considered. So to give you an example, um, even though the mall service does perform well, uh, there have been a, a number of questions that come up regarding its frequency and how it interacts with traffic uh, in the area and who's riding. Um, we did an evaluation of the of the mall service to determine where people were boarding, uh, but we, at the same time, we wanted to see the impacts on uh, persons who use uh, mobility devices. So we looked at our data that we had for the mall shuttle that showed how many times the ramp was de was deployed to get a better idea uh, of that because that certainly has a an impact on uh, the ADA community. Uh, whenever we make a change in a given area, uh, many of our planners are long-term residents of the area and know the area very, very well. We are sensitive to uh, the major generators that they serve, be it a, uh, a high school, we are sensitive to the communities that are served, uh, whether or not it's a low uh, low car ownership per household uh, location. Those are things that you know we really value many of our uh, uh, our planners in our area because they they do have a very good uh, idea of the area that they're serving. So those things are taken into uh, account, and we do make modifications based on that and. The public hearing process, and I can't devalue hearing from our individual customers um, in that whole process because we do learn a lot about how that how our proposals will impact our customers, and often, uh, more often than not, make modifications to the initial proposals after learning more and more about uh, how our proposals will affect the customer. And, and I might add that our policy, our service policies and standards specifically addresses it. There's a section of standard for service for transit dependent persons and to social service destinations. And in addition, we do a Title VI and environmental justice evaluation for every run board service change. So this is Dana and I um, I want to first acknowledge that we are very close to time for this committee meeting. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, I have to hop off at two. But um, Jesse or Jeff, you know, I I am looking at the packet and I see the breakdown um, based on 
like class, um, at least I want to make sure I understand that based on class. I'm just wondering, what does the TAP data look like um, for specific fare structures? You know, one of the charges of this group is to look at the fare structures, and you all have both local, regional, low income, or the LIV program, um, the, the youth fair, do you all have any of that information and what that boarding per hour looks like with those specific fares? Um, I'm not exactly sure what you're asking. We, um, <clears throat> we have the amount of fair revenue that's collected um, and by route, Things like um, passes and all the rest of those things are really allocated by by a financial um, model. Uh, if you're looking to try to connect fare collection with the actual location where riders pay their fare. Yes. And so if there's a way to connect, for example, if I'm a low income resident, I use the live program and I'm on the 15. Is there a way to connect that? Um, we don't know. We don't actually know. We, we know a person gets on and gets off, but we don't know who they are. Um, there is uh, the fare box does record whether it's like a pass or it could be a discount pass. But you wouldn't be able to associate that with the person, um, and I don't think you could even with a location because the fare box doesn't connect into the automatic passenger counting system. Um, but uh, you would have to look at you know the like the Dr. Cog and demographic type data to see you know income and that sort of thing, which we do. Yeah, I think Jeff, this is Ron. If I, Dave, if you don't mind, if I try to reinterpret your question, because I think I get what you're trying to get after. See if see if this is right. Um, I think what Dave is trying to get at is, does RTD collect any information kind of per line about because you collect data about the number of boardings? Does that information also disaggregate to how many of those boardings are using a youth pass or a senior pass or a low income pass? Yes, that's exactly what I'm getting at. Uh, overall, yes, the, um, our finance has the, the, uh, the amount, the number of passes sold, tickets sold and collected and all that information. Um, but it's hard to get that at a uh, disaggregate level. At the line, um, at, the line route, at the line level, at the service level. Yeah. yeah. And that's about the lowest level we would we would have it. Um, <clears throat> we've kind of gotten away with that because the fare box information is not as reliable. Um, but it is possible to make that kind of a connection at probably at the route level. So, so Jeff, uh, I, 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 Matthew, just real quick on that. I know time is getting short, but just as a follow up. So Jeff, there's no way through like tap data that that couldn't be obtained. Um, you're talking about like our smart card, you know, and yeah, passes. yeah. Um, <clears throat> there are agencies that are able to do that, where they've been tap data to more location and even the ability to see where, see what trips, the origin and destination of trips, and that would give you much better information. If, Kind of what the query is at this point, you know. Two, you know, what trips people are making related to how much they're paying. We don't have that capability at the moment. Okay. Um, Jeff, real quick. Well, I mean, to everybody, I, this is probably what Matthew was going to say. I know we're getting pretty close on time here, and we want to be respectful. I know everybody's busy. Um, with regards to the next meeting, like we do, we, I, uh, Commissioner Lee Jones and I were having conversations earlier. And I think, you know, if it pleases the group, we'd really like to start, you know, taking on, um, you know, the equity and services bullet, as well as the community-based services and delivery bullet. Um, so if we could start hitting home on those a little bit and kind of develop some some concepts that we can have a, a conversation about that we will do internally and then provide those to you if if that's of interest to the group, just to, just to have a conversation about, um, you know, what's possible with regards to, um, you know, 
better communication, better coordination, or whatever with uh, with local governments in that, with, as a, uh, associated with um, with uh, the services that RTD provides. Does that sound like an approach that would be appealing to people? Because I think we'd like, you know, the purpose of this today was to provide you with some foundational information and what's possible, right? Some of the information that's out there that you can review at your leisure. But um, I think we'd really like to start getting into having a conversations about the, the objectives. Not hearing any concerns. We'll probably go forth with that then and, um, and provide you some additional info. All right, Matt, Thank you, you Doug. I was going to uh, yep. I was going to suggest that that we continue this conversation next time, and wanted to thank Jeff and and Jesse for uh, being uh, being here today and and providing us with all this great background information. So I would suggest that uh, like 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 Doug just said that we continue this conversation uh, at our next subcommittee meeting. Thank you for having us. Thank you guys very much. Appreciate you. Bye, everybody. Have a great Good day. Good luck on that. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.